So I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence. And probably you're wondering if I'm at the wrong conference, right? There are lots of conferences with big headlines about artificial intelligence. If you believe any of the quotes on the screen, then you would know that you're not going to make any money in simulation. You're probably not going to be employed. <clears throat> and if you are employed, then you're going to be working on something that is marginal and is not uh, marginal to, the, to society and is not as important as electricity or fire. But I don't believe that because I believe simulation is an AI technology. And that's the case I'm going to try to make today and talk just a little bit about how that works. OK, so I want to start by showing you a video, if you guys could hit the video. When people say, I want to learn about AI, they almost always end up at this website. How, how many people, raise your hand, how many people have actually been, seen this, this website, this uh, GIF? Yeah, a few, all right. Not as many as I would have guessed. Um, and, and what this is, I mean, well, let me ask you. I mean, what, what do you see? What I see is a simulation. I see a simulation of a maze. Uh, maybe of a robot or uh, you know some sort of uh, fake mouse that's uh, learning to run a maze. What I see is a simulation, and so when I see this, I say, "Why is this artificial intelligence? Why isn't this simulation?" Well, okay. So now, if you could go back to my slides. Uh, okay, let's. Okay, there we are. Okay. So I think part of the answer is artificial intelligence is not, not one thing. Artificial intelligence is a lot of things. That, and, and the most interesting parts of artificial intelligence are combinations of these different elements. So in the group that I work in, uh, we tend to focus on these five. There are other things that you might include in this bucket, uh, which we'll, we'll leave for uh, uh, drinks tonight. But the, the, the key five are right here, and the first one is, is machine learning. And this is just this idea that we're going to use data to, to drive uh, the algorithm. And the way I think about sort of traditional ML is that it's really an extension of, of uh, statistic, statistical approaches, statistical algorithms, uh, and, and other kinds of things that are data-based analysis that we then learn to extract some rule from and, and, and use. A related but different concept is this idea of deep learning. And deep learning usually based on neural nets and much more sophisticated algorithms. Um, and they are particularly useful for unstructured data, data that uh, much more complex where we don't actually know what we're looking for exactly. Uh, and so this is, you know, sort of the, the, the kind of the, the uh, uh, more sophisticated version, certainly the neural net version. Simulation. Hopefully you've heard of simulation. Now, these three things get coupled when we, we use a technique called reinforcement learning. So if what we use is data to train our networks, then we can choose at times to, to do that in a reinforcement learning technique. And I'm going to spend quite a bit of, time, uh, of my time today talking about that. Now, there's two things that go along with this. We won't talk about it today so much. But one thing that happens is you push a lot of data around when you do this. Data at scale, simulation at scale, the ability to run tens or hundreds or millions of simulation runs to deal with all the data. That, that is a, a big part of, of cracking this nut. And we also do a lot of work in natural language understanding. Won't talk about that so much today. OK, so, so how, is simulate, or how is AI and uh, simulation connected? And I like to think of it as three use cases, sort of three buckets of ways that these things work together. The first of those, and, and the, the thing that all the cool kids are doing, is is using simulation as a way to train neural nets and to, to do what's called deep reinforcement learning. So if you float around the internet 
and go to those AI sites, well, a lot of people will say is real AI, real AI, is deep reinforcement learning. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Of course, that's just what someone's decided. It used to be something else, but, uh, but that is where all the action is right now. And we use simulation to train these, these deep nets for the, the same reason we use simulation for everything else. If I have to have a lot of data and that the real system doesn't exist, is too expensive, is too dangerous, the experiments can't be performed, whatever those reasons, you have to simulate it, right? If the reality doesn't exist there, you have to simulate it. Same reason we use simulation for everything else. That becomes deeply coupled then into our ability to create an artificial intelligence that can provide additional insights. Okay, so that's one use case. A second use case is, is the simple, the very simple situation is that our whole, the whole simulation business is, is based on this idea that we're going to build a model that reflects the structure of the world, and that structure is going to generate the behavior that we observe in the world. If, if the real world has AI components, if it has machine learning components, um, if it has uh, other, even robotics or other things, then those have to be represented in the simulation. I have to have a simulation capability that can do that. And so that's an, a, a second way that uh, simulation and AI become coupled. And I, I see this happening apace in the operations and supply chain world where maybe r relatively simple uh, ML algorithms can be used to control uh, certain processes or optimize some routing or something like that. Then, then those, those capabilities have to be reflected in the model of that supply chain if you wanted to create a digital twin or something like that. Now, the third, the third category is, is not something we don't, we, see, we don't see as much talked about, except maybe in the academic world. And that is, if I'm building simulations and I want to understand, um, first, I want to be able to build the simulation more rapidly. I want to evaluate or calibrate its performance, uh, then I can use AI tools, uh, particularly machine learning tools, to um, help calibrate, help debug, and, and uh, help me build my models. And so we're doing actually quite a bit of work uh, where we would use ML models to uh, evaluate uh, maybe 10,000 or 100,000 runs of a simulation model and uh, help us uh, evaluate whether it's framing the way we expect it to or not. So most of what I'm going to talk about today is in that first category. I'm going to talk about some of the work that we're doing where we use uh, simulation in the reinforcement learning technique and deep learning and deep, uh, uh, deep networks. So what's reinforcement learning? Let's talk about that a little bit more. <laughs> Anybody, so, so here are three simple physics examples. Anybody who's taken physics would be able to write, using any logic, a simulation model of, of those, those cases, right? You could write the equations. You write a series of equations that would describe the, what it took to balance or uh, the, the, the mountain car hill. I, I actually had a car like the, the mountain car hill once. <laughs> it was an old beat up truck. I had a little trouble getting out of the airport some days if the hill was too steep. So, um, so you, you could write those, write those equations. But in a reinforcement learning technique, what we would use is some sort of machine learning model that would, that would by trial and error, by trial and error, learn <clears throat> what the right rule was to, to, to accomplish the tasks at hand here. And, and it uses a simple carrot and stick approach. So if the, it, it, will by tri, it will randomly try different things. And for those trials that succeed, it gets a reward. And for those trials that fail, it gets punished. And over time, it learns that it should do one thing and not the other. And that way, it learns the rules. Uh, and so it, 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 I love this phrase if you, you know, read the press, what that means is you don't have to write any code. You don't have to write the code. You don't have to write the rule. Of course, you have to write a boatload of code to, 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 to produce a reinforcement learning, but once you have that, the rest of it's easy. So uh, in any case, that's the, the general approach. 
So let's, let's dig into this a little bit further. Now I'm guessing you guys have found those demos, or those simulations. Okay, very good. Okay, so what we're looking at now is a model that is uh, built in AnyLogic. It's, very, it, it's another grid world model. I think it's obvious why we call these grid world models. And most of what we see in DeepRL these days is still grid world models. And in grid world models, what we do is we lay out what we would call a state action space uh, where, uh, I, don't know if, I don't think I have a laser pointer, where every square in there uh, uh, is a, a state, essentially, and there's some set of actions. So in a, this very simple case, the actions are very simple. There are four. For any grid that the car is in, uh, it can only go up, down, or left, or right. That was the same as we saw in the other one. Now, this setup is a little bit different. The car always starts in, I think, what's going to be grid uh, zero 02. And it has to pick up a package that you can see uh, in grid 333. Three, three. Um, and it has to deliver it to the destination, which is a checkered flag. And uh, it has to learn how to do this. So this, this simulation has to run maybe 3,000 times uh, for it to learn, to learn the, the right route. And, the, and it, for it to get rewarded, it has to pick up the package and it has to get to the destination. There's a, there, if, you, if you look at the layout then, what you see, and I'm going to try and describe very concisely how this reinforcement, this training process works, is that Every square uh, has a score. It's called the Q score, or quality, uh, associated with that action. So there's four actions, and then along each of the, the sides, you can see what that score is. And during the training process, and may, it might have been hard to see uh, at this distance, but during the training process, those scores were changing uh, as, uh, as, as the vehicle tried, did trial and error. And uh, the square was colored red when all the scores were bad. In other words, when they were all bad moves. And it was uh, turned green once there are good moves to be made. So the way that this training process works is for every state that the car finds itself in, then uh, it can try one of the four moves. And by trial and error, then the quality of that move uh, becomes established, and eventually uh, it will find a, a good path. And the fascinating thing to me is that that's guaranteed to, if you do this right, I mean, if you implement this right, it's guaranteed to converge. It's guaranteed to find a path, and if you, and it was guaranteed to find the best path. And so that's a fairly remarkable fact, right? So, so, so the way this worked then is that first part of it what was happening, that exploration phase, it was moving randomly. And I think you saw the percent of random moves counter going down as it ran. It was, it was trying things randomly. And then as the simulation or as the training period progressed, then it would more and more choose, would, would exploit the historical learning, and it would more and more choose the, the best uh, move. And so that's how it incrementally learns through the process. So that's the quick as I can describe reinforcement learning. If we can go back to the presentation. And so this is sort of the, the setup. I mean, this is sort of how it works. This is called the DQN algorithm. There are other algorithms. There's, and, and I will say, this, this is a space that's changing very, very fast. But uh, this is an algorithm that we're working with right now. And I think this course summarizes our, our, our experiment. We have a vehicle. It can choose, well, it shows three. But we can choose one of four values. Uh, and, and there's a Q value or a score for each of those. That, that vehicle goes into a simulated environment. Now, in grid world, that's a very simple environment. But still, it's a simulated environment that changes its state the new state is scored, uh, whether that was a good move or a bad move. Uh, and that's then used to train the neural net. And that happens progressively until the network is trained. And once it's trained, then the, every move, every state has the best move uh, associated with it. So, uh, 
So, so grid world is fine. That's mostly what we see presented uh, at the AI conferences, since this is actually a simulation conference. But that's mo grid world is mostly what, what's presented at AI conferences. Um, what, I wanted, what we're working with is trying to go beyond that, because that's interesting. Uh, there's been a lot of success with that. Uh, some of the best known successes are, are for example, with AlphaGo, where uh, a, a deep uh, RL network was trained to play Go, was trained to play Go better than any person. But the part of that that I thought was so exciting was not only was it better, better playing than any person you know, through the history, they found strategies that, that humankind had not found, that AI found strategies. And that's what's so exciting about this is the ability of this technique to, to find insights in our models, in your simulations, uh, in your complex worlds that as a group, we might not ever find. You know, the game of Go, it's been around a long time, billions of people have played it, and yet there were strategies that humankind had not found. So, so that's what makes this exciting, and so we're trying to say, well, how do we do that with, with any logic? So what, in terms of you know, implementation, the way the world is mostly today is this is mostly a Python tool set kind of world if you want to implement um, DQ in networks or similar sorts of networks. And the problem with that, of course, is that's not an easy integration into a simulation environment. Uh, so we uh, did some research. There is a, we, we use a package, an open source package called DL4J. I think there are others as well, but that's what we do, and we take advantage of the extensibility of any logic then, because that's a, that's a Java a library, nothing special from the computer science perspective on that. And we then can implement that DQN algorithm as part of, a, of a, any logic simulation model. So, so what's the next step? Obviously, grid world's not that interesting once, once we sort of understand how it works. And our interest is applying it to real world business problems. The first real world business problem that it gets applied to inevitably is autonomous vehicles. Because guess what? Autonomous vehicles look an awful lot like grid world. Um, and so um, that's the, the one of the things we did. We've, we've done a lot of uh, consulting in autonomous vehicle world. Uh, we've delivered a lot of complex simulation models of autonomous vehicle fleets uh, where we painstakingly wrote all the rules that control the movement of the vehicles, all of their policies. It's all uh, rule-based in the traditional sim simulation uh, approach. Um, and that's what we delivered and, and successfully to the client. So what we did as an experiment then is we, is we attempted to uh, use reinforcement learning. Well, the first thing you find out when you do that is you have to simplify, in the current state of the art, you have to simplify the problem so much that you can only get something that's partially deliverable to the client in that space. But even more importantly, in the current state of the art, because the rules that the network embodies are opaque, in other words, I could never tell you for sure what was going to happen, then in something uh, like a transportation system, that becomes very hard for the customer to accept, right? They, they want explainable AI. So a whole research process that we're involved in today is explainable AI. How do I explain what that network's going to do under different characteristics, which is maybe next year's presentation. OK, so if we want to move beyond grid world, we, we thought it would be interesting, and frankly, we, we thought it would be relatively easy, and I'll tell you our experience on that, um, to, to use the consumer product, consumer market game, which we sometimes call the candy game, um, uh, that is distributed, any logic distributes that is one of their example models. It's mostly an example about how to build an agent, sort of an agent-based model and model interactions and word of mouth and stuff like that. And uh, hopefully most of you are familiar with it. This is a screenshot of their standard model. It's a setup where there's three companies, red, uh, green, and blue. They all sell a candy. 
Uh, the market for that is, I think, a thousand consumers, kids uh, that uh, are have a, both a local, you know, local spatial relationship, and then also there's a global spatial relationship. And you have the ability to control price, you know, from the user interface and and some of the other uh, sorts of values. And uh, you would attempt to win the game against all your friends. So um, what we thought we would do is replace, replace one of the players with an AI. And then we could you know, apply our, some sort of rule-based uh, system to the other players and see whether we could build an AI that would, would beat the human player. Uh, now, the first thing you're going to think about, and so, so this becomes actually a template a template for a, st for a strategy, right? So if you want to build an AI that can learn strategy, then this is really a template game you know, for, that, for that process. Now, the first thing, as soon as you start to lay this out, the first thing you realize is, well, we're not in grid world anymore now, are we? <laughs> because the state action space is not spatial. It's uh, an abstract, multidimensional surface, if you want to think of it that way. It's a continuous space, it's not discrete. Um, the actions are continuous uh, so that they, they're much more complex and it could be many, at least in theory, many more kinds of actions. So the complexity of the problem just immediately goes way up and is in many ways you know, sort of beyond, beyond what people are talking about in, in the AA space. It, it, and, and, this, and it really gets to even what do you want to specify for the reward? So in, in the, the grid world I showed you, the reward was simply you got 10 points if you, if you hit the target and you, you lost a point for every move. That was the way that worked. Well, this is much more complex. Uh, and so even specifying the problem in a way that uh, makes it tangible or makes it solvable is difficult. So the way we did it, though, is we used DL4J. We, we replaced the uh, red player. Uh, this is sort of the setup. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we, we kind of set that all up. And we, and, and we had to gamify it, too. You know, strategy questions often, often don't lend themselves to be condensed to a game with an endpoint, right? that even that construct makes the setup more difficult. But we went ahead, we said we only care about 90 days because we figure you know, that's the way most management teams are anyway. Um, and and uh, you can kind of see the process here. We, would, uh, we played the game a thousand times uh, and we went through that search process where initially the player would be in exploration mode, right? So would take random moves, try different things, and then as the training progressed, would move to exploitation, uh, where it would use what it's learned to try and uh, win the game. And then, okay, and then finally, after we trained it in that, in the, that step, then we would test it. So we'd run 100, 100 games, basically, and see how it did. Well, the answer is it doesn't do that well yet, actually. <laughs> we set it up against four different kinds of players. Uh, a player that promotes at five-day intervals. So every, day, every uh, five days, it'll promote. Or a different pattern, which is three promotions in a row at 15-day intervals. Or uh, one that's responsive. So every time the AI would promote, it would promote, so when it would just do tit for tat. Um, and then also, let's protect share at all cost mode. That's another very common uh, management strategy, uh, and we'd see how that works. Well, <clears throat> you can see the results there. If you would expect, you know, the null hypothesis is that if things were working right, we all had the same rule, we, we'd probably win a third of our games. Uh, under the simple, those, those pattern rules, uh, uh, so far, this is still a work in progress. It does fine. It doesn't do so well in those sort of reactive sort of spaces. And, and, the, and the reason, there's a couple of reasons we think uh, as, we, as we continue work going down to the journey. Um, the, firstly, well, firstly, one of the things we learned was this AI, your AI is going to find every weakness 
in the simulation model that exists. It will explore every state and the implications of that state. And so it's, it's sort of like using an optimizer, except on steroids. And the uh, consumer products game, it's a really nice example model. The uh, actual consumer choice dynamics in there, I wouldn't trust them. And uh, what the first thing we, so we discovered actually that, okay, the AI is, is actually finding all kinds of, doing things that we can't you know, understand, but it's basically because the underlying causal physics are not quite right. And then we think that, uh, that there are some other issues that we're still working out in exactly how you train it. How do you set the reward? We're really struggling with some of those sorts of questions. So uh, we've already talked about uh, the abstraction, uh, the game, you know, structuring as a game. Uh, it, you, if you don't simplify your state action space, if you continue to increase this concept to a broader concept, it's going to explode computationally. And then finally, just the last two, uh, th this issue about whether the, whether the um, un un unusual result or the unexpected result is because the, you, you didn't train the model correctly, if you have a, 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 a software bug, or is it the underlying causal effect, very hard to debug because of the opaqueness of understanding what that neural debt does. Okay, so this is uh, my last comment. Be glad you're in the simulation business because you're also in the AI business and you can contribute to society and uh, continue to be employed and get paid. Hi, a question. So, um, so when you use simulation to generate data for your deep learning training, are you concerned about what you're really learning is the logic that built into the simulation? Yeah. So you are learning the logic that's in the simulation. The question, so that's not really the question. The question is, does the logic that's in the simulation represent the causal system, you know, the real system, in a way that's of adequate fidelity? Yeah. Well, that's right. So you can certainly build in your biases. I, like I said, this sort of builds on the, uh, the observation that if there is any weakness in the result, or in, in that underlying causal model, this technique will find it. It just, because it searches the entire behavior space uh, in, in, in complete detail. I can't hear you on that one. Yeah, that's right. It'll undermine your result. And, and so that does leave you looking at the results going, well, is this result uh, an artifact of, of the model? Now, I will say that that's not really a different problem that we face already today, right? So if I provide a strategy result to my client based on my simulation results, then um, I'm, probably, I'm sure that most, most of us face that. Your, your client says, ah, well, you just built, built the answer into the model. That was the answer you wanted all along, right? I mean, certainly someone said that to you. So really, you're asking that same question, but this does bring it to a different level, right? And so really the question is, is the underlying causal representation of a high enough fidelity uh, that to be useful? That's really the question. Yep. Hey, Lyle. Yes, Scott. Uh, great presentation, as always. Uh, first, I want to comment. Um, I noticed that you say most of the AI work is in grid, you know, grid world. That's almost exactly like cellular automata for agent-based models, and we finally broke free of that yeah. at some point. Yeah. So I would kind of expect the same thing to happen to AI. The other thing is I noticed in your, um, in your uh, consumer market game, all of your strategies had nothing to do with price. Is that because it was continuous variable? Because um, I would imagine that, especially if you start adding two AIs to this and only one person, they start undercutting each other all the way, almost, almost all the way down to zero. It, it actually just has to do with trying to keep it simple. So we can promise a result because obviously any, that would be, I don't know if you saw, it, all of the state action variables that we would want, those action variables would clearly include price. And then you, it, and then you have to say, well, it's not just price, but what's my adjustment strategy, right? right you know? So, so the, the state action space can explode very, very quickly. Uh, and it's tempting to say, well, you just can't do that. I mean, ultimately, we just can't do that. But what I think 
The real answer is the game is about to go up an order of magnitude and intensity. The amount of compute that's going to be required, the connection of the different algorithm, you know, different technologies, the different algorithms together, is all going. It, the, you know, this is a turning point, uh, and that's the reason why we're investing in space. And to your point about you know the agent-based world, uh, that's just another you know agent models used to always be grid world models, and uh, I would just say that that just shows how much simulations far ahead of it is than the AI guys. Yeah. So. So along that lines, can you talk a little bit about you know the rough number of parameters you had in that simple game, uh, and compare that to you know your runtime or the amount of computation required, you know, does, just ballparking. Yeah. So yeah. So so w we have purposely kept it constrained because we're not confident. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be. I don't know how many presentations we get in a work in progress in this place, right. but everybody wants to talk about the stuff that's perfect. Ours isn't perfect yet. And so we're sort of keeping it constrained, keeping it relatively small. I think the number of iterations in that training, uh, well, see, I think they're doing 1,000. Uh, you know, I'm going to say 20,000 maybe or something. It's all, we're keeping it all very manageable, right? Okay. But, but that's largely because we, we keep simple, we're constraining and simplifying the question. It's easy to see as soon as you open that box up a little bit. The, the learning complexity goes up by an order of magnitude. So you'll notice also when we set up the training, we, we train specifically for uh, each of those competitor cases. I didn't train for, for the case where randomly a competitor might choose one or the other cases or change its behavior over time, right? So as soon as I do that, then once again, my state action space becomes very large and my requirement for compute and so forth becomes very large. All right. Oh, one more. One more. I had a question about, um, you mentioned um, the Go example about how the computer could actually develop uh, knowledge of strategies that we hadn't thought about before. Mm -hmm. when, you're, when the objective for AI in simulation is to develop new strategies, vice win the game, what are some key considerations you need to change in either the sim infrastructure or the AI infrastructure? You mean in terms of being able to make that work? Or just, just, just at arriving at a strategy as an end result rather yeah. than um, mm -hmm. almost a predictive capability rather than just a purely reactionary right. capability. Right. right. Yeah, so, well, it, it, a lot of that gets down... <laughs> It gets down to selecting the reward structure. So the way, uh, the, from grid world, what we know is there's an, an immediate and a final reward. So every time the, in, in the grid world, every time the car ma moves a square, it costs them a point because it costs, it costs something to, to move. But when you get to the reward, you get a bunch of points, right? So that's, that's kind of the way that works. Well, in the strategy space, you have to think about whether that's really the right way to think about it, right? So you, you could imagine, for example, that every period of negative returns costs me something, but if I hit my, you know, 20% return at the end of the game, then I win. You know what I mean? I, it all gets into how you want to measure that result, which gets into sort of a, you know, kind of to, just to, to the business decisions, you know. And so uh, so it, it's actually fairly tricky. It also has to do with what you think the state space really is, right? It, it, the, you know, we chose to obviously, you know, share and, you know, stuff, but the state space could be much bigger than that. So, all right. Oh, that's fine. That's good. Oh, I can't see. But. Hi. Hi. I'm Basil from uh, Short Light Education. Uh, I almost don't even know where to start because the intersection between simulation and artificial intelligence clearly has, uh, there's a lot there. And I was just thinking that in my world, we do a lot of machine learning for predictive analysis based on consumer behavior. Yep. But then the flip side of that is that we also do a lot of simulation where we're modeling 
structures that are known where we understand the causal logic right. and we're precisely modeling consumer behavior because we don't understand the causality mm -hmm. and therefore we're aggregating decisions in such a way that it's an illusion of understanding but at least it's predictive. What is there, as you've been thinking about this clearly more than I have, is there anything in your mind where you see a clean separation between something that is machine learning or artificial intelligence versus simulation? Because just thinking about it and listening to you, it certainly sounds like you're always modeling known structural components and causal logic, and then there's some point where you're now switching over to the unknown side of it. And I can't conceptualize what that, that distinction is in any clear way. Yeah, so that, that's a slippery slope. Um, so the, the way I started thinking about this, you know, of course I come at this from a history of simulation and I have a, a lot of colleagues who, I mean, I'll just say, don't know anything about simulation. They come at this entirely from me. They were astounded that simulation wasn't important to AI. They thought that was totally unique. In fact, that chart that with the little feedback thing, originally it had that little tiny block. It didn't say simulation, it said there's an environment. I was like, that's a simulation. Oh, that's what that is. I thought that was great. So, um, so but to, to your question, when, I came, when we started thinking about it, I've been writing consumer choice models for decades, right? And, and I didn't have any artificial intelligence. Sometimes I didn't even have much of the other kind of intelligence. I had to come up with something, right? And so we, you know, I mean, there's a whole body of knowledge about uh, how do you model consumer choice? There's a set of rules, and we have incremental logic choice, and we have all kinds of things, and we do our conjoint analyses, and we, you know, we do all, the, we have all these techniques, and we model consumer choice. And you can still argue that, you know, Maybe we understand it or maybe we don't. I mean, I'm, that, that whole concept of understanding, we do observe certain behaviors. And we see certain patterns. And we see those patterns of behavior and we capture them in rules and we put them in simulation models. And we've been doing that for a long time. So this is another way to find those patterns. But what makes this different, what, what, what the promise here is, is it can find patterns that we would never find without this kind of a tool. That's the promise, that we can find new ways to see these problems that you're not going to capture in a loaded choice. And, and that, there is, you know, uh, this is more important than fire electricity. I mean, you saw it on the first slide, right? So that's the promise. Now, whether, you know, how hard is that to achieve? I, I think it's hard. Uh, but uh, it's pretty exciting. It's a lot of fun. So that's what we're working on.